<laughs> hey guys, out here at this outdoor expo, getting ready to get random people um, coming through. But out here with our business partner, Damon, um, he's about to do a quick talk on the trailer made trailers. Um, let me let me flip it to him. He's much more interesting. My name is David Deschamps, and I'm the co-owner of Trailer Made Custom Trailers. Uh, we are a custom design and fabrication firm based out of Denver, Colorado, and we're here today at the Outdoor Expo uh, for the weekend, uh, supporting uh, the tiny house movement. We are the gatekeepers, if you will, to the movement by way of our network of professional builders throughout North America. Uh, we have some of those in attendance today. We've actually got some in the audience. We have Modern Tiny Living, based out of Columbus, Ohio. We have uh, Tiny Foundations Northeast in Connecticut. Uh, we have Tiny HQ from Florida, and a number of our builders here. Um, we have Switchgrass Homes, Modern Tiny Living, Tiny House Chattanooga, uh, Tiny Nest, and I'm sure there's probably one or two I'm forgetting, but uh, please, uh, at some point today, if you guys haven't had a chance to uh, peruse through the tiny house village. We absolutely encourage you to come take a look at what these phenomenal builders and uh, designers have done with their tiny homes on our foundations. So to tell a little bit of our backstory, um, a few years back, uh, we were in a very different uh, path by being a trailer manufacturer. And by way of being a custom manufacturer, uh, one day, an, uh, an interesting fellow walked into our office and said, have you ever heard of tiny houses? And uh, my wife, Natalie, and I uh, were operating a pretty small business at that time. And we said, yeah, we've, we've watched the show a couple of times. So we, we're, we're, we're somewhat familiar with them. We kind of know a little bit about the movement. What can we help you with? And he said, well, I'm going to go into business building these homes. And I need trailers built uh, to withstand uh, a life of... A foundation for someone's house and it was uh, it was a bit of a daunting task because what I had seen in the industry prior um, was a bit of MacGyvering and some uh, what we call where I'm from redneck ingenuity and um, we hadn't really evolved into a professional trade yet as an industry in the tiny house movement so we were still very much an insurgency and uh, there wasn't a right way or a wrong way to do it. There was just whatever way you could figure out. That was fine uh, for, for the short term. But as, as we grew into this business and we thought uh, after the first one that we would never see it again until a couple walked in a week or so later and had heard through the grapevine that we were building tiny house trailers, uh, that all of a sudden this influx of, of new business came through our door that we didn't know where it was coming from. We weren't soliciting it, and we weren't uh, advertising or marketing that we were in the tiny house industry. So when people ask us, how did you guys get into this business? We say we didn't. This business got into us, and uh, now it is absolutely a, a way of life for both Natalie and I. It's, this is what we do for a living. Um, four years ago, we, we did one trailer for a tiny house builder, and now our business is the tiny house industry. And we work with somewhere between four and 500 builders all over North America. Um, and we supply the foundations for countless do-it-yourself projects throughout the country, either directly from us or through one of our distributors in the country. Um, so to, to, to go from unit number one to now 15 distributors nationwide, and between four and 500 builders in North America, all using trailer-made foundations for their tiny home projects, uh, has, has really been a, a remarkable journey for both of us and, and for our staff. Uh, it, it, we still see no end in sight to where this thing will take us next, so we're, we're really fortunate to be a part of it. And talking about fortune, the, the industry was born out of necessity. The, 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 the masses of people that have gone into exploration of the tiny house movement, uh, the, the reasons that people do that are never the same, and we never hear anything but diversity from them. So uh, an empty nest couple where the last kid has gone off to college and now we don't need this big giant house, uh, so it could be a downsizing or a traveling situation. Grandma's got some new grandkids, so she wants to go park her tiny house in 
their, her kids' backyards and play with her grandkids, uh, but she still has her own place. That's one, that's one example of why people choose to go tiny. Another one is um, if you're in a younger generation, the millennials, for example, uh, they have not bought into what us Gen Xers did from our parents. We don't have to go to college for four to six years. We don't have to plug into one job and retire from it. We don't have to buy a house as soon as we have a credit score that allows us to. And we don't have to spend the next 30 years paying it off. Um, add to that, uh, I live a smaller, more simple life so I can enjoy more of my life. I don't need things to replace uh, time in, in the scope of happiness. I don't have to, um, I don't have to stay in one location. I can back my truck up to my home and take it with me wherever I choose. These are all reasons that every generation and every walk of life uh, have, have at some point or another found, uh, found a chord to strike with the tiny house movement and how it speaks to them. So it's, it's fun that we always have this constant barrage of new stories and, and uh, new motivations for why people choose to go tiny. And it's nice because we are step one, like I said earlier, that we are the, we're the gatekeepers, if you will, to the tiny house industry. Uh, it's our responsibility to know the ins and outs of the business, to know the regulations, to know um, the laws and how they're, how they're changing and how they're working for us and how they're working against us. We also have to know about code, uh, zoning, uh, DOT regulations. Uh, the, there, there's really no, no scope of this business that being the first point of contact between a potential future tiny houser and realizing their dream of owning a tiny home, we have to know everything from step one to step last. And we have to be able to share that to a market that frankly just doesn't know what they don't know. And that's okay, because we all learned, and now what we know, we have the opportunity to share that to the people who didn't know before they got a chance to talk with us. It works really well that way, because we have a very interactive relationship with every client, every builder, and we all work together to gather information and compile it and make it kind of an aggregate um, utility for everybody to ask questions and hear the same answer, no matter who they ask it from. So if you're speaking to us and we say zoning laws are A, B, and C, the idea is you're supposed to be able to talk to Modern Tiny Living and say, uh, what, are, what are the zoning laws pertaining to this? And they say A, B, or C. So it's important for us to be kind of a network of professionals working in this industry as it went from this little tiny insurgency to now this giant industry. And uh, it has become a multi, multi-million dollar business in just a few short years. Uh, and we, we see no end in sight because we're the only modern society on this rock that we call Earth that lives in the way that we do. We have thousands of square feet under a roof. We have tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of stuff filling up that big house sitting under that big roof. And we're still the same size human beings that we've always been. And uh, I remember, for some reason, there's a study that pokes out in my head that, and I think I heard this from a project we were working on at Kansas State University. The studies have been shown that the human beings that we interact with today need between 70 and 100 square feet to function and live uh, in the most efficient, most healthy manner possible. Now, if you think that through, every person that's sitting in this audience needs 100 square feet. That means the audience that I see here probably wouldn't utilize uh, to 100% capacity and still maintain efficiency the average size home in our hometown in Colorado, which is about 3,400 square feet. So it takes, uh, it takes a whole different shift of the mind to go from, I need 2.2 kids, a white picket fence, two car garage, quarter acre backyard, a swimming pool, this, that, the other thing, and I need to spend my entire life paying the bank back because I couldn't afford to write a check for it or pay cash for it day one when I wanted to buy it. So it's exciting to see from an economic standpoint where the market is going to send the future generations of our American society. Are they going to continue the trend of consumerism and maybe a bit of gluttony? Uh, or are we going to scale down our lives a little bit and get out and live? 
there's there's an old adage you either either live to work or you work to live and <laughs> everybody true. has now an option with tiny house living to decide if they want to make the switch from living to work or doing what we want to do now which is work enough to just live and enjoy life and enjoy the people in it, it doesn't have to be things anymore so we kind of feel like we're a bit of a catalyst to help people realize that and, and make the shift from uh, consumerism to just enjoying life at your own at your own discretion and uh, it, it really does uh, bring the whole thing full circle when you see in the tiny house village today all walks of life all ages all categories all different sizes of families coming and asking us questions about having someone build their tiny home for them or building their own tiny home and uh, I'll talk about that for a little bit the two different types of tiny homes that are built are either um, custom homes or maybe a bit of a, a spec or a, um, a model home that a, a builder manufactures on a medium to large scale or a complete custom design that a customer would bring to a builder and then have it built by a professional. That's, that's one category. The other category are the DIYers. So for those of you who are sitting in the audience by a show of hands, how many are potentially going to be DIY tiny house owners at some point in the future? All right, so half the audience, that's great. Uh, the other half of you are either just beginning your research or you're considering a builder or you've already decided that you have a builder in mind that's gonna help you pull the trigger and go tiny. So for the DIYers uh, who are still probably 65 to 70% of our market, um, it's our job to be their project manager, their therapist, <laughs> um, their help desk, their supply house. We have to wear a lot of hats in the DIY world because like I said earlier, in the DIY world, sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. So it's nice to be able to pick up the phone and talk to somebody who does. And when we know that those people are calling us and, and asking us to sometimes rescue them, uh, it's a big responsibility. So it's important for us to make sure that the information we give them can be vetted. So we're not just kind of making stuff up on the fly. We have to make sure that it can be substantiated by either a code or a zoning regulation, or a planning committee, or a municipal ordinance, whatever that looks like. But there's a lot of rules and regulations to follow out there in the building trades world. So by default, this little trailer shop in Denver, Colorado became uh, a, a nationwide corporate entity um, that's still run like a very much a mom and pop shop. And uh, you know, you're you're talking to the two highest, the, the two highest ranking members. Uh, of, of our organization. The CEO is in the audience and I'm the COO uh, of the company and um, we are also married and we still get along after we work for 10 or 12 hours a day for seven days a week. <laughs> um, the tiny house world, by and large, has um, evolved to a point that we're starting to reach a bit of a glass ceiling, in our opinion. Two things that are lacking. Zoning and, 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 and permitting is one big hurdle that we have to overcome. And the reason that we can't overcome that hurdle first is because we are not all out there speaking the same language. You have builders who are adhering to RVIA code, which is recreational vehicles. Um, many of those are built here in the state of Indiana, just a little bit north in Elkhart. Anybody from Elkhart? Okay, good. Um, most of the stuff down on the show floor today is... Uh, manufactured in Elkhart, Indiana, or somewhere close by. And those are RVs or travel trailers. And they're built with a certain life expectancy in mind. Seven to 10 years is the average. Uh, they have a two to three year warranty on them. Some have as many as five. And if there are some that have a longer warranty period on them, that probably means uh, the price goes up along with the quality. And then uh, another, another set of codes or an industry that exists in the, in the subsection of the tiny house world would be a uh, park model or modular home RVs that uh, can be taken to a build site in pieces and assembled, final assembly on site. Um, park models are like giant tiny houses that are wide loads, they're over 13 and a half feet high and uh, 
they can be moved, but they're certainly not meant to be traveled with. So the tiny houses kind of bridge the gap between the first thing we talked about, which were the travel trailers and the RVs, and over to the other side of the fence where the mod homes or the park models exist. Something in between means it's some of each, it's not all of one. So the challenge for permitting and zoning and where can I park them and things like that, those challenges come in because we don't know what to call these things yet. And the entire industry is on five different pages in the playbook. Some want them to be RVs, some want them to be ANSI, ANSI code, spec, park models. Some want them to be IRC. That's probably the direction that Trainer Made leans towards. We want to have residential construction code dictating how a tiny home is built. Even though it's sitting on a trailer, what we build is a foundation for a home that can be relocated multiple, multiple times. So it's a little bit of a black eye for somebody to call what we build a trailer. We call them foundations for tiny homes. And tiny homes are um, the black sheep of almost every one of those subcategories in the alternative housing industry. Um, so how do we fix that? And that's the question that's still being asked today, and we're still not getting any clear answers from industry partners. Nobody's, nobody's really willing to change their belief or their, their process to kind of come together and get on one page and have a unified voice to be able to move this industry forward and get a real true sense of what are we gonna call these and how do they belong in the world? So the other challenge to the tiny house industry, um, and it's a bit two part, first part, deals with money. And money kind of makes the world go round. Uh, we like to borrow money to buy things that we don't necessarily have a pile of cash to go spend on today. Um, and with that comes uh, insurance issues. So we don't know what we can call them. We don't necessarily know how they're built, to what code or standards. So banks are a bit nervous or sketchy about that. And there's hardly any financing available for them. We've tried for the last couple of years to get people into the industry that are in the finance and banking world, and uh, it's a slow process. We met a guy last year who was uh, uh, speaking about a two to three hundred million dollar capital investment and in forming an institution for lending on tiny homes. And when we gave him the model and, and, and kind of ran down the numbers, here's how many people are sitting ready with their finger on the trigger, ready to take out a loan of five to 15 years for a tiny house. We ran them out of two to three hundred million dollars over dinner, just on paper before it ever got really to the when can we start part of the discussion. So that opportunity came and went and became a non-starter. So back to the drawing board in terms of financing. If you can't get financing, you probably can't get insurance on it. And the biggest reason we can't do either of those things is because one, we don't know what to call them, and two, we don't know how to value them. So do they depreciate in value like a vehicle does, like a car or a truck? When it's new, it's worth sticker price, and as soon as you drive it home, it's worth a third less? Well, maybe. Or is this more like real estate, where it appreciates in value? Because I built a home that might have cost sixty or $70,000. What is that gonna be worth in five to 10 years? So those are the challenges that we're still struggling with today, even after this industry has been around since probably the turn of the century, around 2001, 2002, with a guy named Jay Schaefer who built the original Tumbleweed Tiny House. Um, the, the next thing that we see going in the, in the tiny house movement in terms of what are the trends? Uh, three years ago, a 16-footer 16 foot long by eight foot or eight and a half foot wide tiny home was the was the standard. That's what uh, people wanted to live in. Within a year, there were almost no 16 footers being sold and they had all graduated up to mansion size 20 foot tiny homes. So 20 footers, 24 footers were the norm for us for about a year and a half. And then a 28 footer came out and um, part of that was from our friend Andrew Morrison, who is on uh, tinyhousebuild.com, and they sell a set of plans from start to finish, build the trailer, build the house, where to put it, how to wire it, how to plumb it, and it was a really good concept, and uh, the Morrison family uh, really did uh, leave, a, leave an impression on the industry on how 
how empowered you can make the average person that knows little to nothing about the building trades. So we expanded on that idea and started offering kits for uh, DIYers at whatever experience level you are. We supply the foundation. The subfloor of that home is already built into the foundation. We call it an integrated subfloor system. So what we call cross members on a trailer, the builder calls floor joists. And uh, we want to step beyond that. We uh, use a CNC machine to extrude house frames into a big giant erector set that you can screw your house frame together in a day or so. If you have zero experience, it'll probably take you a weekend. If you've done a few of them, it'll take you a third of that time. So what we tell people is when you have four walls to assemble in a roof, wall number one will probably take you as long as the remaining parts of the house combined. So the learning curve uh, is a little steep, but it's very short. And once you level out on plane, you find that the process is actually very easy to go from step one to the step last on framing your house. We've taken that guesswork out of the project so that the average builder, um, DIY builder I should say, doesn't have to worry about am I doing this right, am I going to make a mistake, am I going to do something that's going to impact the life expectancy of my home or put me, myself, or my family at risk. And the answer to that is no. We assume all of that risk for you. We take a lot of that value, the, 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 the X factor out of the equation for you guys. So you shouldn't have any guesswork to do on the components that we supply to the industry. With that advent, we've been able to uh, increase the, the number of people and, the, and, and expand the different walks of life that will come into our office and say, I've seen you online, I saw you have a discussion, I met you at this show, I heard what you said, and I thought about it for a year, and now I'm back to talk to you about building my own home. And we hear that on a weekly basis, still to this day. And it seems to be accelerating. So when I was talking about the shift, in the paradigm from with what our parents taught us to what we're gonna teach our kids or what our kids are teaching us, um, we're already seeing an increase in that mindset shift from one side of the fence over to this new thing that the rest of the world has been doing for the last 50 or 60 years. We put them on wheels, but uh, if you go to the United Kingdom or travel anywhere in Europe, seven or 800 square feet is uh, uh, about the average size home and most of them range in the three to 500 square foot range. Um, the very, very wealthy live in a couple of thousand square feet. Uh, the working class live in a few hundred and they're very, very content, very comfortable and very healthy doing so. So we had all this land once and we called it America and now it's turned into this big giant urban sprawl where it's only a matter of time, the state of Missouri where I'm from, where St. Louis and Kansas City kind of meet in the middle of the state because of all of the all of the expansion that both of those cities have done. Now in between there, you have connecting dots, and those are other towns, but we see the same thing happening, urban sprawl taking place all over this continent and abroad in the rest of the world. So the tiny house movement in general is uh, <laughs> kind of like a ship without a captain, and it's a big ship. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of going wherever it wants to right now because nobody knows how to grab the wheel and what direction they want to steer it. And um, we feel that we're kind of like the first mate. So we're, uh, we're kind of helping guide the ship while it's a bit adrift. And once we get it under power, um, our hope is that the industry will continue to evolve with companies like ours, Volstruct, our tiny home builders. We want to keep seeing new and inventive ways to create solutions to problems that we have in this industry. But more importantly, we want to get on the same page and move forward as a force to be reckoned with not a bunch of individuals with their own ideals. Knowing that there are those differences and that those differences can be unified uh, will we'll grow the industry uh, immensely. We'll start to see um, communities. We're working on a couple right now. We have uh, a few thousand homes going into uh, North and South Carolina in the next 18 months. Uh, that was actually a state funded project to solidify, well, I'm sorry, not to solidify, but to rectify a problem that they have with housing shortages, uh, low rates of income in that demographic, um, disaster relief, Section 8, HUD housing. So their old model was to buy mobile homes at a cost of about $60,000 a piece. And they have a, about a five-year shelf life on them. So within five years, 
the repairs begin on those mobile homes that they're supplying to people with uh, housing shortages or low income. And uh, what they end up doing over the next 10 years is spending almost three times what they originally paid for that mobile home on keeping it up and keeping it functional and suitable for occupancy. So this, uh, this outfit in South Carolina that's asked us to partner with them has uh, approached the state and they had some political figures involved and they all came on the same page. And this is a perfect example of what happens when you unify a voice. Uh, we went from the mobile home industry was alive and well in rural South Carolina as recently as 90 days ago. And in another 30 days, we're gonna put them on their, you know what's, because we're now building uh, a, a, a bit larger than tiny home model. They're gonna be about a park model size, but built like a tiny home is. Two by four construction, IRC code, insulated subfloors, uh, high R value, life expectancy of 65 to 100 years. Um, this is very, very, very far removed from what the mobile home industry um, has, has trained us to believe is the okay standard. So if we're changing the status quo, there's bound to be a little bit of resistance to that in most cases. But the unified voice, all the way from the national political level, we have US senators on this team, all the way down to the local town mayor, we're putting jobs into the community, we're rehabbing old dilapidated factories that haven't produced anything for 10 or 15 years, and we're gonna give uh, about three and a half thousand new homes to the market for people that otherwise would not have been able to afford their own. Um, they, the way that we're doing that, I have to go back a bit, um, we're actually taking the, the first phase of building that we're gonna complete and we're gonna allow workforce uh, employees to work off a portion, if not all. I'm not sure what all the details are yet. It's a little above my pay grade, but I'm excited about the project so I get to share it wherever I can. Um, but the, the, the mindset is, you know, we have the factory, we've rehabbed it, we've turned it into a functional facility again that'll do commerce in the state of South Carolina. And down the road a few blocks, we've got about five or 600 home sites that were slated to have uh, foundation builds constructed on them. So all the utilities, the plumbing, everything was dropped on the home sites. And then in 07 and 08, all of those companies uh, went kaput because the bubble burst in the housing industry. So what they call pipe farms, those are plumbed pieces of dirt, are now gonna have uh, 10 to 12 foot wide by 33 foot long tiny homes parked on them that employees uh, will own at some point. It's gonna be part of their compensation package. So we're able to take people off of, um, off of state assistance and HUD or Section 8 housing, turn them into homeowners, turn them into skilled trades people, give them a paying wage, a living wage, um, add, add to that uh, net metering homes. For those of you who don't know, that's uh, tied to the grid, but create energy and then sell it to the utility companies. So I'm getting the two minute warning. Uh, so we, we've gone from what's a tiny house and what do we call it? with uh, a bunch of individuals trying to figure out what, what direction they want their industry to go in instead of getting on the same page with other like-minded people, sitting down in a round table format and figuring out how can we really change this country and maybe the rest of the world as a byproduct if they see what we do and like what we've accomplished. This is what unified voices in the tiny house industry can provide for us. Three and a half thousand homes in the next couple of years, um, probably close to that many jobs by way of this new tiny house industry and saving the environment, scaling down our footprint a little bit and determining that we can work to live instead of live to work. Are there any questions before we wrap up? Nope. Going once, going twice. Tell people how we get a hold of you. Oh, tell people how we get a hold of us. Uh, if you want to visit our website, we are www.trailermadetrailers.com. For those of you who are in this part of the United States, moderntinyliving.com. That's uh, Dan and Robbie and Trent and the gang. They're in the audience today. Thank you guys for attending, we appreciate you. Um, there, are, uh, there are area distributor. Um, we also have Chris Steinus from Tiny Foundations. And if I'm not mistaken, is that tinyfoundations.com? 
Very good. Tinyfoundations.com. For anybody in the southeast, Tiny HQ, they're manning our booth this weekend over in the Tiny House town. Make sure you stop by and say hi to the Mikes. Mike and Mike is what we call them. They're great guys. They're very passionate about what they do. But uh, we have boots on the ground in just about every region of the United States, so it's pretty easy for anybody to get a hold of us. And uh, the best way to get a hold of Natalie or I while we're here at the show is come up and tug on our shirt sleeve and say, hey, I want to talk to you about a tiny house. So thank you all so much. If you have questions after this discussion, we're over here in the tiny house town towards the, uh, towards the wall where the bleachers are. We're at the end of the first row of the tiny homes, and uh, we're here to help you guys any way we can. Thanks so much for coming. Good job. Say goodbye to everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much, David. Super interesting. And, uh, I can't. I hope everybody.